A random smattering of lessons about money, work, and life. First of all, for anybody who doesn't know me, I'm just going to briefly introduce myself in order to give you some background or context behind this. You know when you're a little kid and in elementary school, they give you, or at least some schools, my school, gave me a little uh, booklet where every year was a different grade. So it's like first grade, second grade, third grade. And so once a year, I could put my little school picture in there and then I could fill out my height and weight. And then there was an area for what I want to be when I grow up. Just so you uh, can see what a real type A personality looks like, this was what I wrote in that book in terms of what I want to be when I grow up. I wrote that I want to work part time at Taco Bell. So yeah, that was the kid that I was. When I got a job, I figured I'd be a traditional W-2 employee for the rest of my life. It never occurred to me that there was any other alternative. And so, like most people, when I graduated from college, I got a job that seemed to be the uh, only course of action that I could think of. Now, there was one thing that was a little bit unusual about me, which is that when I got my first job, I already had the intention of quitting. And the reason for that is because I've always loved to travel. When I was in college, I really wanted to study abroad. But those programs, the study abroad programs, were prohibitively expensive, fifteen dollars to $20,000 for a single semester. And so I thought about it and I realized, I don't actually want to study. I just want to go abroad. So I figured that I could graduate, get a job, work for a few years, save up some money, and then quit and go travel. At the time, I had no idea that financial independence, which I define as the state at which your passive or residual income from investments earns enough money to support you such that you don't have to trade time for money anymore. That's my definition of financial independence. At the time, I did not have that definition. I had no idea that such a concept existed. So at the time that I graduated, I figured I would get a job, work for a few years, save up some money, quit, travel, spend down that money, and then re-enter the workforce again. And in fact, that's more or less exactly what ended up happening. So my plan was to follow a model of working, quitting, working, quitting. I call this the mini retirement model, where a few years of work are followed with a few years of relaxation, and, and you kind of swap back and forth between the two. The uh, analogy that I sometimes use is that it's like running sprints. You sprint, then you rest, then you sprint, then you rest. It's the interval training form of organizing your work life. Now, what I didn't know at the time was that, uh, as it turned out, I only ended up being traditionally employed by an employer with a W-2 salary for three years. I was employed from 2005 to 2008. In 2005, I had a starting salary of $21,000. And in 2008, when I quit, my ending salary at that job was $31,000. So that's the most I ever made through traditional employment. So here's what I did. During those three years, from 05 to 08, I had a side hustle in the evenings and weekends as a freelance writer. Over the course of those three years, I lived on the money that I earned from my regular day job, and I saved all of my side hustle money. And after three years, I would managed to save $25,000. This was in 2008. So once I had the 25 grand in my pocket, I quit my job. And then I spent the next couple of years traveling in countries where the dollar exchange rate really worked in my favor, uh, traveling in Southeast Asia primarily. I spent 10 months in Australia, but I was living in a car at that time, camping every night. So for the next two years, I was just traveling. I worked a little bit during that trip, but not very much. I would write the occasional freelance story here or there just to keep my skills fresh and to keep my contacts active. But for the most part, I just lived on my savings. When I came back to the U.S., which was in 2010, I had just a couple of thousand dollars, a couple few thousand dollars left over. I didn't want to go back into the workforce because having had a taste of autonomy, having had that taste of not having to be at my desk in an office at a particular hour, I didn't want to go back. So I figured at that time that I would be self-employed for the rest of my life. At the time, I still, this is in 2010, I still had no idea that financial independence was a concept. I didn't know it existed. I figured that I could live a life of freedom and flexibility 
by virtue of being self-employed. And since I had already been freelancing for a number of years, I had the confidence to know that I could get freelance assignments. And that that's huge. So very slowly, I started making a full-time career for myself as a freelance writer. And eventually, freelance writing actually grew into all types of digital consulting. So digital marketing, online management, brand management. That was later, a couple of years down the road. In the beginning, in 2010, I just started making a a self-employed career for myself, writing articles for websites. Now, at the same time, I was totally freaking out about lack of security. I was worried that these assignments were going to dry up. And my worst fear was having to get a job again. I still had no idea what financial independence was as a concept, but I knew that I wanted to create multiple streams of income in order to safeguard myself against having to go back into the workforce. And so what I did was, I mean, at the most basic level, I looked at how I could increase the gap between what I was earning and what I was spending. Now, at the time, this was in 2010, Will and I had just moved to Atlanta, and we rented one bedroom within a three-bedroom unit. So we lived with random roommates that we found on Craigslist. Our rent for that one particular bedroom in a shared space was $400 a month, and Will and I split that. So our rent was $200 per month per person, plus utilities. I drove a car that had a resale value of $1,500, $1,500. And Will is a vegetarian anyway, so our grocery costs were the cost of eating vegetarian from Costco. So we lived very, very frugally at the time. We weren't making very much. Will uh, had just gotten a job. He had been traveling with me, so he had been unemployed during the years that we were traveling together. And so when we, in 2010, when we came to Atlanta, he got a job making $40,000 a year. And I was getting my freelancing business off the ground, which eventually did well, but in 2010, it had a very slow start. So we weren't making much, but also we weren't spending very much either. Like I said, our rent was 200 bucks per person. And that was how we were able to increase the gap between what we earned and what we spent. And we were hustling hard. I mean, I was up late at night writing articles and up early every morning just pitching editors and accepting every assignment regardless of how, like, mind-numbing it was. And the motivation for all of that, again, I didn't know anything about financial independence. I just wanted to create some type of other stream of income, some sort of passive or residual income Again, not because I wanted to be FI, but because I just didn't want to ever have to go back to the workforce, the traditional workforce. And I wanted to insure myself against that. And so anyway, to to cut a very long story short, we were hustling hard. We were saving really hard. Then we just plowed all of our money into buying rental properties. Then the snowball starts to roll faster and faster, right? Like the more you buy and the more passive income that you're making, eventually that flywheel just starts spinning faster. And so that's what ended up happening with us. And so now we have seven rental units. That's one triplex and four single family homes. And over a long term average after expenses, they collect between $3,000 to $4,000 per month net as a very, very, very long term average. So as I share in my cash flow reports, there are some months where, you know, July 2016, the rental properties brought in negative $7,000 for that particular month because we were making a big repair. But May 2017, the rental properties brought in positive $7,000. So over a very long-term average, they bring in ballpark three grand net, but I, I want to emphasize the volatility there. So anyway, that's my background. That's my story. That's a journey that I've been on between 2005 and today. The reason that I'm sharing that as context is to introduce some of the lessons that I've learned over the course of that time. And so here they are. Lesson number one, simplify everything. Humans are super bad at multitasking and bad at complexity. We have fragmented attention. In order to accomplish things, counterintuitively, 
Simplify them. Don't try to optimize everything. Find the simplest way to do whatever you're trying to do and then move on. So, for example, within your investments, you could spend hours and hours making micro tweaks to your asset allocation. But why bother? Just pick some asset allocation that you're happy with and move on. Same thing with rental properties. You could spend so much time going down the rabbit hole of, all right, well, what about there's rentals and there's flipping, there's wholesaling, there's tax liens, and there's residential and there's commercial and there's offices and warehouses and mobile home parks. Dude, don't try to do lots of fancy stuff. Just pick one niche and one strategy. So for me, my niche is residential properties and my strategy is buy and hold. And it's not because that's, quote unquote, the best. It's not at all. It's because I'm not trying to do everything. I'm simplifying. I'm picking one thing, learning how to do that one thing, doing the one thing, and moving on. Likewise, simplify your cash flow. By which I mean, if you're trying to save money, don't bother creating a detailed line item spreadsheet With loads of different categories where you're like, okay, this is exactly how much we're spending on groceries. This is exactly how much we're spending on clothing because that's complicated and it's time consuming. And how long are you really going to stick with it? If you want to simplify that whole process, there's only one thing you need to do, and it's called the anti-budget. And the way it works is very easy. You pull your savings off the top first and you chill out about the rest. So... Pick a savings rate, could be 15%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, whatever it is that you choose. Automate pulling it off the top first, and then don't worry about whatever's left over. Just take that leftover amount, use it to pay the bills, and if there's money left over after paying the bills, then cool, you've got some fun money. But you don't need to create a hyper-detailed line-item budget, because that introduces complexity into the system. And the more you introduce complexity into a system, the more likely that system is to fail. Simplify your work. Same idea. With every project that you undertake at work, find the simple 80-20 solution. Simplify your workouts. This is big. I finally figured out that I don't need to learn 40 different types of exercises. I just need to do a few. Bench, deadlifts, squats, some cardio, some stretching. I don't need it to be any more complicated than that. Simplify your eating. Think through the way that you shop and plan and prepare for meals and then ask yourself, all right, how could this be simpler? And your answer is going to be different things for different people. Like for some people, you'll just eat the same thing over and over and over. For some people, you'll subscribe to a meal subscription delivery service. For some people, you'll just give up on eating entirely and drink Soylent. Have y'all heard about that? That's like a meal substitute thingy. I've got a bunch of friends who are really into it. Whatever it is that you choose, just think through your eating process. Wow, I make it sound like a lot of fun. Woo! Think through your eating process and simplify it. So that's lesson number one. Simplify everything. Lesson number two. Risk equals probability times magnitude. Think of every decision within this light. So if the probability of something is low, but the magnitude is high, then there is inherent risk. And by the way, low probability, high magnitude events are the ones that you definitely want to insure for. I have health insurance with a super, super high deductible. So if I get hit by a bus or if I get diagnosed with cancer, that's when it's going to kick in. But for a hospital bill for four or $5,000, I'm going to have to pay for that out of pocket. The reason that I have that health insurance is because when it comes to something like getting hit by a bus or cancer, the probability is very low, but the magnitude is high. Therefore, it is a risk that I want to cover. Conversely, if the probability of something is high, but the magnitude is low, then I don't need to insure for that event. I do need to recognize that it is an inherent risk, but I don't necessarily need to insure for it because the magnitude is so low that I can handle it myself. Furthermore, the framework of risk equals probability times magnitude 
gives you a way to think about decisions. So when you are making a decision about an investment or a career-related move, or if you're sending a bid to a client, you can use this within that thinking process, that decision-making process. Frame your decisions within that light. And also ask yourself, what's the worst that can happen? Because oftentimes, once you start to think through the worst-case scenario, you'll find that it's actually not that bad. And many of the things that scare us are pretty survivable. So that is lesson number two. Lesson number three, never delay gratification. Now, this might sound counterintuitive, right? But isn't money supposed to be the, the practice of delaying gratification, having a sucky right now for the sake of an awesome future? Uh, I would argue no. Like, change your framework. Be gratified about growing your investments. Be gratified by putting money in index funds. Be gratified by watching your net worth grow. Like, I'm not delaying jack. When I put money aside for the down payment on another property or when I max out a retirement account, dude, that's not delayed gratification at all. I love doing that. When I track my net worth and I watch that number grow, that's extremely gratifying, much more so than buying a piece of junk. So lesson three is don't delay gratification. Change the things that gratify you. Lesson number four. Know your millionaire next door number. So there's this formula in the book, The Millionaire Next Door, that determines whether you are a prodigious accumulator of wealth or an under accumulator of wealth. And that formula is your age multiplied by your annual pre-tax income divided by 10. And that number is your target net worth. For example, if you are 35 years old and you make $70,000 a year, well, 35 times 70 divided by 10 is 245000 So according to this formula within The Millionaire Next Door, that's your target net worth. If your net worth is higher than that, you are a prodigious accumulator of wealth. If it is lower, then you are an under-accumulator. And by the way, this formula does not work for people who are in their early to mid-20s. You know, if you're 25 years old and you make $70,000 a year, well, then according to this formula, your net worth should be 175000 there are not going to be a lot of 25-year-olds who have that net worth. If, if you graduated from college when you were 22 and then maybe stayed in grad school until you were 24, well, great, you've been in the workforce for one year. So ignore that formula if you're in your early to mid-20s. But, but for people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, keep checking in with that formula because that will, uh, that's a number you ought to know. By the way, if you're a couple, the way that you can uh, work with that is just take your average age multiplied by your combined annual pre-tax income. The book doesn't say that. That's just like my own workaround. All right, lesson number five. Don't half-ass anything. Whole-ass a few things. There's a fantastic quote from an author named Cal Newport, who was also a previous guest on this podcast, where he says, if you service low-impact activities, you're taking away time you could be spending on higher-impact activities. It's a zero-sum game. Essentially, what he's saying is that you have time for anything. You just don't have time for everything. And any hour that you spend on X is an hour that you're not spending on Y. There's a trade-off there. So be very careful and cognizant about how you spend your time. Clipping coupons is probably not the best use of your time if you could otherwise spend that time building a side hustle instead. I mean, if you're going to spend four or five hours a week doing something that relates to improving your financial life, well, I would argue that those four or five hours would be much better spent building a micro business or learning about how to make investments rather than stacking up like buy one, get one ketchup bottle offers. Lesson number six, when you're not at work, don't be at work. Either be focused on work, on doing your actual work, or be focused on something else. Never be in between. And this is the art of being present. One of my pet peeves is uh, when I go to a party or even actually this happened the other day in an Uber. Anytime that I meet a stranger, 
the natural opening question is, oh, so what do you do? And that question leads to a conversation about work. And it's one of the ways in which people are at work, even when they're not at work. You know, you're not working at the time, but your mind is still there. I've actually started a new game where if somebody's like, what do you do? Uh, I'm like, okay, I'm going to list three different things and you have to guess. And that kind of turns the conversation, uh, it gives it a more of a fun flair. The other way to do it, and I really enjoyed this one. Someone said this to me at a party. He was like, okay, I'm going to ask you what you do, but here's a stipulation. You have to lie. You have to invent an imaginary career, and I'm going to ask you a whole bunch of follow-up questions, so you have to make it believable. And I was like, sweet, game on. Um, and so that was a lot of fun because it provided an icebreaker that allowed us to be creative and imaginative and and have a really interesting conversation. It essentially turned the interaction into a little bit of improv, which was a lot more fun and a lot more meaningful than going back into the routine scripts of like, well, so what do you do? Well, so what do you do? That's just one example of the, the broader point, which is when you're not at work, don't be at work. When you're not at work, don't constantly be thinking and talking about work. You're not there. Don't be there. So that's lesson number six. Lesson number seven. Yes, and. Speaking of improv, life gets a whole lot easier when you take a yes, and attitude towards whatever comes your way. And that example that I just shared, you know, you're at a party and someone's like, so what do you do? Rather than pushing back with resistance and being like, oh, I don't like to talk about work or, oh, I don't come to parties to talk about work. You know, that kind of puts up this wall and it cuts off the conversation. But if you yes and it like, oh, hey, that's a great question. All right, I'm going to list three things. You've got to guess. You know, that's a lot more fun. That yes ands it and brings it to another level. So that's lesson number seven. Yes and. Lesson number eight. Money can't make you happy, but a lack of money can make you unhappy. There have been multiple studies that have looked at the correlation between money and happiness, and they have found that there is a massive correlation between money and happiness at the lower to mid levels of the income bracket. So essentially, going from 30000 a year in income to 50000 a year in income, that has a massive, well-researched, well-documented correlation with happiness. That money will make you happier. But the richer a family gets, the more you hit diminishing returns. Each additional dollar increase in household income begins producing marginal gains. Different studies have postulated different ideas about what that kind of tipping point is. There's a very famous study that says the first $75,000, there's a huge correlation between money and happiness. After 75, it diminishes. There are other studies that show that the marginal gains start dropping off somewhere between 80 to 100,000. Some studies show 160. Of course, it all depends on how large your family is and where you live. You know, $100,000 for a single person living in Iowa is not going to be the same thing as $100,000 for a family of eight living in San Francisco. So it's a little oversimplified to talk about dollar amounts in a vacuum. But the broader point is, and that is, again, going back to lesson number eight, money cannot make you happy, but a lack of money can make you unhappy. Lesson number nine, every conversation about money is really a conversation about values. Every financial conversation is really a discussion about trade-offs, opportunity costs, priorities. Again, it goes back to you can afford anything, but not everything. By the way, when we talk about money, and specifically when we talk about spending money, there's also been some research about the correlation between discretionary purchases and happiness. And what researchers have found is that Spending money on experiences and time does have a happiness correlation, whereas spending money on material items does not. The satisfaction that we have with experiences actually increases over time. One of the theories behind this is that when we spend money on experiences, those experiences are then subject to nostalgia bias, which means that when we look back on that trip to Disney World, we don't remember the long lines and the kids getting fussy and the dropped ice cream. Like, we don't remember that. When we look back on that memory, we remember the highlights. So experiences actually become rosier and become more cherished over time, whereas objects depreciate. 
All right, lesson number 10. Oftentimes in the world of money, the less you try, the better. We see this in index fund investing. Trying to constantly optimize to the point of over-optimizing often produces worse results than the set-it-and-forget-it approach. The people who often hop in and out of the market, buy low, sell high, buy now, sell then, oftentimes over a long-term aggregate average, do worse than people who just maintain a very consistent dollar-cost averaging approach into their investments without attempting any market timing. They simply maintain a reasonable asset allocation, rebalance periodically, and leave it alone. In the world of investing, often, less is more. Lesson number 11. Work with your nature rather than against it. Don't try to fight your own nature. Don't ever tell yourself, well, if only I had more willpower, if only I was more disciplined. You know what? You are who you are. Accept it. And then find ways to work with your inherent nature rather than constantly battling against it. So, for example, a couple of years ago, there came a point where I decided I wanted to drop the vast majority of my freelancing and consulting clients because I'd gained financial independence through rental properties, so I didn't need the money, and I'd rather spend that time traveling, writing, podcasting, you know, doing things that I thought were much more interesting. And I really struggled with that because I thought, well, if only I were more disciplined, I could do both. If only I were more disciplined and focused, I could keep a lot of the clients that I have and continue to make money while also going to the gym and cooking more and traveling more and writing more. But you know what? I'm not more disciplined. I'm not more focused. And eventually I just had to accept that and realize, you know what? I can't do everything. So if I want to lead the type of lifestyle that I want to lead, well, then something's got to go. Another example of this is the use of forming habits rather than willpowering or disciplining yourself into something. For example, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is I drink a glass of water. And it's not because I have willpower or discipline. It's because I formed a habit. And so at this point, it's muscle memory. I don't even think about it. I wake up and boom, I'm chugging a glass of water. Done. There's a great quote by Charles Duhigg, the author of The Power of Habit, which is another fantastic book, where he says, willpower isn't just a skill. It's a muscle, like the muscles in your arms or legs and it gets tired as it works harder. So there's less power left over for other things. In other words, don't try to rely on willpower. Instead, form habits. And in order to do that, keep the old cue or trigger and deliver the old reward, but insert a new routine in that gap between trigger and reward. That is how you form a habit. And so for that habit that I just named, the trigger or the cue is waking up, And the reward, to be quite honest, the reward is inherent. The reward is feeling better as a result of doing that. And I can, I mean, maybe it's psychosomatic, but I can feel the effects almost instantly. I I feel better after drinking a glass of water. So I have a cue, I have a reward, and then I have a routine in that space in between cue and reward. That's how the drinking a glass of water habit formed. So that's lesson 11, work with your nature, not against it. Lesson 12. The thing should be its own reward. My reward isn't, oh, I drank a glass of water, therefore I get a chocolate chip cookie. My reward is, I drank a glass of water, therefore I feel better. I feel more hydrated. The author Gretchen Rubin has done a lot of research around this. She's found that rewards are counterproductive because you begin to see an activity as a means to an end. And so if the means change, you could ignore those means in pursuit of the end. For example, If you reward yourself with a blueberry muffin every time that you go running, then your brain starts to think, okay, well, if I go running, I can eat this blueberry muffin. You're not actually learning to appreciate running for its own sake. You're only learning to cope with running in order to get you to that muffin. The better approach is to find the inherent rewards of running like how you feel immediately after a run, and focus on that as its own reward. The thing itself must be inherently rewarding in and of itself. Remember what I mentioned earlier about don't delay gratification? 
how I get super gratified through the knowledge that I have contributed to a retirement account, I'm not delaying gratification into the future. The investment itself, the knowledge that I have made an investment into my retirement account, that itself is inherently rewarding. I don't give myself a cupcake when I max out an IRA. I just max out the IRA and I love the fact that I've done it. So that's lesson number 12. The thing should be its own reward. Lesson number 13, radical self-reliance. Everything is figure outable. You are more resilient than you think and you have the ability to draw upon your own inner resources. So believe in your ability to rely upon yourself. Now, part of the idea behind radical self-reliance involves staying inside of your locus of control. In the book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey, he illustrates these two circles. One is called your circle of concern. And inside your circle of concern is everything that you could possibly be worried about, from nuclear war to whether or not your socks match. Inside of your circle of concern is something else that's called your circle of influence, And those are the things that you are concerned about that you also can directly influence, like whether or not your socks match. So in order to be effective, focus on what is inside your circle of influence. You can't control whether or not we find a cure for Alzheimer's, but you can directly influence whether or not you have contributed to that cause. We can't directly control what's happening out there in the world, but we can directly influence how we are managing our own lives, our own money, our own finances, our own careers, and our own families. You cannot control the general obesity rate in the United States, but you can make sure that you yourself are healthy. So stay inside your circle of influence, and as you do, The more that you stay inside of that circle of influence and that locus of control, the bigger that circle of influence grows until you are able to directly influence more and more. That is the power of living inside of your circle of influence or your locus of control. That's lesson number 13. Lesson number 14, achieve being through doing. Act first and the feeling will follow. The best cure for writer's block is to start writing. The best cure for not wanting to exercise is to start moving. You don't need to feel like you want to do something before you do it. You do it first, and then eventually the feeling will catch up. There's this triangle, thought, behavior, and emotion. If you want to change any point on the triangle, you change the other two. So by changing your behavior, you can influence your own thoughts and emotions. So that is lesson 14, achieve being through doing. Lesson number 15, curate. Own fewer but better things. Put more thought into each item. Previously on this podcast, we interviewed Jean Chatsky, the financial editor of the Today Show, and she mentioned that she has a personal rule for herself. She only buys items at full price. And the reason for that is because she found that when she was shopping sales, She would pick up things that she didn't need because they were a good deal. So now, by only buying things that are full price, she owns fewer but better things and has less junk because she puts more thought into every specific individual purchase. When you're clearing out your closet or clearing out your your garages or your attics, the question is not, what should I get rid of, but rather, what must I keep? What is so amazing that I want to keep it? And if something isn't in that, that top echelon of this is so great that I really want to keep it, then why do you have it around? And once you get rid of a lot of your things, once you've really curated your personal possessions and you own fewer but better items, well, you'll find actually that your taste for spending drops. Your taste for wanting to accumulate a bunch of stuff drops. There is nothing frugal about going to yard sales and buying a bunch of stuff that you feel lukewarm about. You're better off spending your Saturday mornings working on a side hustle or even sleeping in and getting some rest or exercise rather than building a habit around accumulating more and more. 
It isn't about accumulating, it's about curating. And the final lesson, lesson number 16. What is stated happens. Which, by the way, has a cute acronym. What is stated happens. And what I mean by that is that our words seal our fate. And our actions follow our words. If you say things like, oh, I'm not a very good investor. Well, guess what? Then you won't be. If you say things like, oh, I'm not very hands-on, or I'm not good at math, or I'm not good at science, I'm not very social, if you say that, then you're not going to be. Our actions follow our words. So be careful about the words that come out of your mouth. That's why I don't believe in the statement, I can't afford it. That is a self-defeating statement. You can afford anything, not everything but anything. I hope you enjoyed this video. Subscribe to this YouTube channel so that you can catch all the latest updates. And if you liked it, share it with a friend. 